Well, that's not the best way to start things, but that what Zoom requires. Um, good morning. I'm Tim Bardick, and I'm here in my role as a member of our Sunday Services Committee. And I'd like to welcome all of you to People's Church this morning, and a special welcome to anyone who happens to be visiting this Zoom service. And we hope it helps support you, support you in moving forward thoughtfully in this very strange time we're all living together in. People's Church is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association. We're part of a long tradition of liberal religion. Among other things, liberal religion believes that religion begins with a sense of wonder at what we do not know. A truly liberal religion recognizes that there are some truths in our lives about which we cannot speak with words. And for these truths, we must be comfortable with the creative silence while still having faith enough to move forward and take right action. So our presenter today uh, will be Megan Reynolds. Megan is an attorney. She's a court administrator and she's a survivor of having four teenagers at home during last year's remote school year, a remarkable accomplishment. She and her family have been members of People's Church since 2010. Welcome to Megan. We look forward to hearing from you a little later. And now we'll go to our opening song. It's now time for our chalice lighting. So if you choose to light a chalice, uh, if you wish, you can indicate um, uh, in the chat that you're lighting a chalice uh, in whatever community you wish to identify. For our chalice lighting words, these words by uh, Barnaby Feeder. We kindle a flame we trust will lead us forward as we travel in unknown lands where the question, shall I ever get there, resounds a clear, pure note in every silence.
As you heard, Zoom has announced to everyone that we're resuming recording. And um, we're now going to have our offering. Uh, People's Church depends on the time and talents of its members and friends. And it also depends on their willingness to help support the church and support the work it does both internally and in the broader community. So I now invite you to contribute as you're able and willing. And uh, you'll see a link posted in the chat and that link will uh, enable you to give online if you choose to do so. And I think Savannah has some offertory music. If you could join me in reading the words for giving thanks, which will be posted in the chat. For the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life, gifts of love, gifts of sustenance. We bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone.
We have three readings this morning. The first is by Wendell Berry, poem, How to Be a Poet, and he has, he subtitles it, To Remind Myself. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Well, that's interesting. Let me start that over again in case the recording stopped. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have, inspiration, work, growing older, patience. For patience joins time to eternity. As for any readers who like your poems, you should doubt their judgment. Breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensional life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it. Of the little words that come out of the silence like prayers, pray back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. And from Raina Maria Rilke, if only for once, it were still. If the not quite right and the why is could be muted and the neighbor's laughter and the static my senses make, if all of it didn't keep me from coming awake, then in one vast thousandfold thought, I could think you up to where thinking ends. I could possess you even for the brevity of a smile to offer you to all that lives in gladness. And finally, some words that are attributed to the Buddha and were uh, or said to have been the uh, Buddha's statement to his son, Rahula. Whenever you want to perform a verbal act, you should reflect on it. This verbal act I want to perform, would it lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both? Is it an unskillful verbal act with painful consequences, painful results? If on reflection, you know that it would lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or maybe to both, it would be an unskillful verbal act with painful consequences, painful results, then any verbal act of that sort is absolutely unfit for you to do. But if on reflection, you know that it would not cause affliction, it would be a skillful verbal act with happy consequences, happy results, then any verbal act of that sort is fit for you to do. While you are performing a verbal act, you should reflect on it. This verbal act I am doing, is it leading to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both? Is it an unskillful verbal act with painful consequences and painful results? 
If on reflection, you know that it is leading to self-affliction or to the affliction of others or to both, you should give it up. But if on reflection, you know that it is not, you may continue with it. Having performed a verbal act, you should reflect on it. If on reflection, you know that it led to self-affliction or to the affliction of others or to both, then it was an unskillful verbal act with painful consequences and painful results. And then you should confess it, reveal it, lay it open to the teacher or to a knowledgeable companion in the holy life. Having confessed it, you should exercise restraint in the future. But if on reflection, you know that it did not lead to affliction, you know that it was a skillful verbal action with happy consequences and happy results. Then you should stay mentally, ref mentally refreshed and joyful, training day and night in skillful mental qualities. Good morning, I'm Megan Reynolds. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I know the title of my speech is a little bit odd. Uh, so I wanted to explain um, how I worked my way through to giving the talk the title that I did. Um, the real truth is that I, as this day was approaching, I had a lot of apprehension about how skillful any verbal act I might make would be. and I didn't really know what to offer. I didn't feel particularly worthy to give a talk um, on any given topic at this time when I feel so profoundly uncertain. Um, and I didn't wanna fake my way through it to this audience. So it's been an exhausting year and maybe I've lost some self-confidence that anything I have to say could matter very much um, or be a benefit to others and I feel quieter and more humble than in other periods of my adult life where I may have been excited to be asked to speak, especially to this audience of people people. A good friend encouraged me to try this anyway and reminded me that many other people could be feeling something similar. When we went into quarantine in March of 2020, many of us went through a manic cycle of Zoom cocktail parties and Zoom book clubs and Zoom Sunday extended family meetings. My alma mater even had a Zoom reunion dance party that was as awkward as the real thing and nowhere near as fun. Uh, then a few months into it, when it became clear that this whole thing wasn't gonna end anytime soon, um, most of those Zoom dates fell off the calendar, at least for me. Um, keeping on top of remote work and remote school for my kids became about all that I could deal with and that's the feeling I had for most of my friends as well. I became content to be more quiet and shift my attention to those acts of service that were necessary and kept my family comfortable and well-fed and attended to as best as I could. If you didn't have any interest in what I was cooking that day or how cute my dog is, I really probably had nothing to say to you. The great John Prine said, uh, in Angel from Montgomery, how the hell can a person go to work in the morning and come home in the evening and have nothing to say? But I, I was working right where I am sitting right now. So um, that, that feeling was very prevalent in that, in that time period. And that's when I saw the New Yorker cartoon that was, was in the order of service and that I sort of took inspiration from, from today. Um, for those who may not have seen it, I'm just going to put it up for a second. And I'm going to get out of the way. So it's just a woman sitting in her New York apartment uh, alone on the phone. And it says, did I tell you about the really big pigeon I saw? I did. Oh, sorry. I ran out of new things to talk about months ago. And it's just a New Yorker cartoon. You know, they're funny, but it kind of stuck with me in a way that felt meaningful. And at that period of time, it just reflected and captured how I felt, that I'd run out of things to say, 
that I only wanted to speak when it was necessary for work or parenting or household man management or the occasional big bird maybe I saw. Um, that most importantly that I no longer felt so enamored of my opinions of the day's events. I think what was under the surface was that I wanted to reserve my energy because every new day meant facing challenges that were so novel and so resistant to any available solution. Every day the search for the right thing to say in critical moments took real energy. And like today's reading by Rilke, the not quite right and the why, and especially the static that my senses make and the static that the senses of the people around me make was so loud. Although this panic induced feeling was new for me, not knowing what to say or how to say it, it was an old and familiar feeling. I have a very charismatic mother who is an exceptional storyteller and a quick wit. I always felt really slow and stuttering in comparison. My sister and I joke about how watching her with the grandkids, you can see it again, how she has a slightly impatient way of editing the kids' meandering, boring stories to make them shorter and funnier and punchier. Her employees once presented her with a gift that had her unspoken management motto on it, be, br be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. But this last year has been an order of magnitude above my usual performance anxiety. Through the pandemic, I felt the weight of the hours and the questions just sitting on my chest at all hours of the day. What is there to say that's meaningful and useful and necessary? Who needs to hear what from me in any given moment? How do I make myself emotionally available to my loved ones hour by hour, minute by minute? How do I convey what they most need to hear from me? And what can I say that's most needed to fill to, in each subsequent wave of this seemingly never ending crisis? When we're busy and buzzing around then, be brief, be brilliant and be gone, may be the expectation and work well for us. But the pandemic has been a time of never being gone from each other or very, very infrequently and needing to fill many, many hours of togetherness, hopefully in meaningful and nourishing ways. My daughter, Rosie, who had just turned 12 when the lockdown hit is now almost 13 and a half. This has been such a lonely time for her. And one of my memories I think I'll always have of the pandemic is her coming in and in the middle of the day and you know I'm working and she's taking a break from school and she would just sigh and say so you know so and it's just exhausting it's hard to explain how much those moments feel like failure when my attempts to fill the silence for her and connect with her don't land and when she wanders back to her room alone and clearly and justifiably dissatisfied with the state of the world in 2020 and 2021. The quiet sound of her door closing, echoing through the quiet house is for me the saddest sound of the pandemic. Excuse me. So what wisdom have I drawn upon to withstand these challenges? Um, well, if there ever was a time to practice equanimity, uh, this has been the time. The Buddhist teaching is that equanimity arises when we accept things the way they truly are. When presented with the next thing that feels too hard to manage, we can stop ourselves from reacting with, and now this, and change it energetically to, and now this. So that's a practice. When I don't know what to do or say, I've gotten somewhat better about just sitting with it in a non-judgmental and non-reactive observation, or at least telling myself that's what I should try for. I've also gotten better about modeling and counseling equanimity and family conflict by encouraging myself and those around me not to bring our hot take to the moment, um, but to try to become less attached to our hot take and to wait for us to get back to our baseline before speaking and to encourage harm reduction strategies and how we deal with conflict to show up for each other as non-judgmentally as we can. The concept of right speech, the Buddhist concept of right speech is helpful with this. Right speech is the third of the eight path factors in the noble eightfold path of Buddhism. And what is right speech? This is the quote. And what is right speech? Abstaining from lying, 
from divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter. This is called right speech. The third reading today, also from the Buddhist tradition, describes right speech as a verbal act that is skillful and which does not lead to affliction or to painful consequences. Some people are familiar with it um, from a more Western context of think screens before you speak, whether something is true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. I recall that when I first started coming to peoples, I questioned whether equanimity and right speech should even be my spiritual goals. After all, I have so many very good opinions and I'm very attached to them. The story of the farmer and the refrain about not knowing whether any occurrence in the story is good or bad was slightly irritating to me back then. Surely I know how to evaluate and speak to whether any given thing that happens is good or bad. I'm an attorney. I spend my days evaluating and speaking to the goodness and badness of facts. But the pandemic, the pandemic has been extremely humbling. Um, the Trump era had already worn me into exhaustion about how much there was to react to and opine about on any given day. And then here comes the pandemic and the insurrection and the avalanche of politicized misinformation and exhaustion for I think all of us has hit new levels. Audre Lorde famously said, your silence will not protect you. And that is absolutely true in relation to abuse of power and systems of oppression. Silence can also absolutely be a form of violence in interpersonal relationships. But silence does offer certain protections from certain destructive habits of mind. Self-centeredness, ego, delusions of grandeur, spite, erring on the side of silence while fighting against those impulses can save a person, save a relationship, and save a family. Even better than silence is right speech. Being mindfully selective about what I say in moments of interpersonal conflict feels like the highest goal I can reach for. I'm someone who has historically jumped in to solve problems when someone shares them with me. If I had given them my first impulse, it would be to tell someone what they did wrong or right and how to fix it. But those verbal acts, especially when they're not invited, as I've been given an opportunity to learn from over and over, are not skillful and they definitely cause affliction and unhappy consequences. I live with four teenagers and I've learned a lot about watching from watching their reactions. It's, it's good information and it makes me think twice in believing I can improve upon the silence. Also, the pandemic has brought me up short. What advice can I actually give them about how to endure a school year and a half shut up in their rooms? There's no fix right now just endurance and equanimity and trying to make life as bearable as possible in our shared space. And so as far as the future, I hope to keep working on right speech and right action for my family and others around me to make them feel good and understood and nourished and loved. And if that makes me a quieter person, then so be it. I've learned that people will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This quote is often attributed to Maya Angelou, but I've read it's not actually her quote, which is kind of ironic. Uh, in any case, it's true no matter who said it. However long this pandemic lasts, may we continue to bear up under it with as much equanimity as we can muster, with as much faithfulness and quiet encouragement of those we love. May we use the opportunities we have to use our words to comfort and heal and hold each other up. May it be so. Thank you. So the next part of the service um, that I'll introduce now is the questions for sharing and listening. Um, these are questions that um, may, may fit well for, from what I just shared um, and maybe guides to discussion for yourself. We're going to be broken out into smaller groups through Zoom, through the magic of Zoom um, for about 10 minutes, and then we'll return to the main group. Um, I'll read the guidelines for discussion and then I'll read the questions before we go in. So the guidelines are discuss for discussion are please speak the truth as you understand it. And then to avoid inhibiting the flow of discussion, do not comment on others' comments and sharing until everyone has had a chance to do some initial sharing. So these are the questions. How, if at all, has the pandemic changed your understanding of what the world needs more from you? And how do you practice or how could you practice, start practicing uh, right speech. Thanks. You'll see something popping up to ask you to join a breakout speech, a breakout room. For all that is alive, we sing our thanks and praise. For all life is a gift. 
gifts which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad for needs which others serve for services we For sorrow we must bear, for failures, pain, and loss, for each new thing we learn, for fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, for all that is our In a moment, I'll read our uh, closing words, but just a reminder after the closing words, um, you can either leave the service and go on to do your business, or if you want to be part of uh, 15 minutes of a virtual Zoom coffee time, just stick around and you'll be allocated to randomly to a Zoom coffee room. I don't know if that's the term, but it's a separate Zoom room. Closing words come from Gary Kowalski. Go in peace, speak the truth, give thanks each day, respect the earth and her creatures, for they are alive like you. Care for your body, it is a wondrous gift. Live simply, be of service. Be guided by your faith and not your fear. Go lightly on your path. Walk in a sacred manner. Amen. So, as I said again, um, if you wish to stick around for virtual coffee hour, do so. And uh, if you want to instead leave, please feel free to do so at this time.